Hey everybody, welcome in to our worship gathering for the Point Church in Perdido Key, Southwest Pensacola. We're delighted you're joining us today for our worship and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Before we do, a few things we wanna talk with you about. If you're a guest today and uh, you're not feeling real connected with our church or if there's some prayer request or need you may have, you can email us at hello at to the point dot church. That's hello at to the point dot church and we will respond to you as soon as we can. This weekend is a special weekend because we're beginning our regatherings on both campuses, Perdido Key and Alberta. Uh, Josh, talk a little bit about what's going on on our Alberta campus this week. You know, it's a great time to be part of the Alberta campus. This week, we're gonna continue our gatherings outside, so next weekend, we'll have another outdoor service. And then throughout the week, we're gonna be feeding our kids uh, with our feeding ministry that we've been doing out there, we, we're actually adding another family to that uh, ministry to support them. And then the renovations team has been hard at work working to renovate, to bring that campus to all that it can be so that we can serve Alberta. And that renovations, they're going to start this week as we create some more parking spaces to help accommodate our congregation as they may meet there on the campus. So what's the plan for uh, the 1st of June in Alberta. Yeah, so as soon as June rolls around, June 7th, that Sunday morning, we're gonna start with two services meeting inside the church. And this is gonna be great because it'll be the first time the Point Church in Alberta meets inside that building. Uh, there'll be one at nine o'clock and one at 1045 to accommodate some social distancing within that facility. And at this point in Perdido Key, we're looking at that weekend being our time to go back in the building. And let me say, we've learned this over the last two or three months, things change daily, all right? So this plan is as of today, we're going to have on Saturday evening a 5 p.m. service, a 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. service on Sunday. Now let me share with you how we're gonna do that, all right? Now, pending the final approval of your vote, and be looking for that in your Realm email, we're doing an online vote for the renovations for both the Perdido Key and Alberta campus. Those renovations are beginning. So we're going to be gathering for worship on Sunday in the month of June in DuBois Hall, which is actually our fellowship hall. We'll have that set up as a worship center. Five o'clock on Saturday, 9 a.m. and 1045 on Sunday. Now here's what we're doing. We're doing online registration through Realm. We're just gonna to try to get an idea of the numbers. We're looking right now at about 175 per service. And so we're gonna let you email in the service that you choose up to a certain number. But we're designating the Sunday morning 9 a.m. service for those 60 and above, or those who may feel vulnerable. Now, if you're 60 or above, we're not telling you, you can't come to the 5 p.m. on Saturday or the 1045 on Sunday. Uh, you can register for those just like everybody else. But we just felt as a staff that it might be a good thing to create a comfortable environment uh, for our senior adults to be able to come in the room and spread out and sing some hymns and enjoy some social distancing fellowship uh, in a clean and safe environment. And let me say, our team is working really hard uh, to keep the environment clean and to make sure that we're safe. So please help us uh, with that social distancing. Now that's on June the 7th, uh, that's still two weeks away. So we have one more Sunday, Lord willing, weather permitting, of having outdoor services in both Perdido Key and Alberta. I appreciate John Vickers, our next generation pastor, our cameraman extraordinaire, our video editor. He's been doing so much for these last few weeks. John's primary ministry is our students. Ms. Karen works with him as the children's ministry coordinator. And so I wanted them to take a minute. Uh, guys, we're right here at the end of the school year. Uh, and usually going into summer, we're, man, we're getting geared up for VBS and we're making plans for summer camp. So uh, just share with everyone uh, where we're at today. Yeah, absolutely. Summer is usually the busiest season that we have in a children's ministry and student ministry. and. Unfortunately, a couple weeks ago, we had to let our students and their parents know that we were not gonna be able to attend uh, our planned summer camp that was gonna be in the month of June. We're making some plans to have some kind of in-person uh, 
small youth camp towards the end of the summer. And of course, uh, parents, if you have any questions about that, I wanna invite you to reach out to me. I'd love to, to talk with you about what that may look like. You'll be getting an email from me in the next couple weeks asking about some of your thoughts about us getting together towards the end of the summer and ways that we can continue to serve your family throughout the summer. So our youth small groups will actually start to meet uh, in person, in, uh, in host homes, kind of like Disciple Now, you'd go to a small group leader's home to be able to have some small group discussions. We're still a few weeks away from that. Again, everything changes by the day. Everything that's, that we're dealing with right now is uh, something that we were not planning on a couple months ago. So I want you to, to stay tuned for some more updates about that, and hopefully we'll be able to be together again uh, very soon. But again, we're gonna be looking at those guidelines and, and the recommendations from our church staff and from our task force about how we can safely gather together. So right now, we would normally be one week away from BBS, and I was saying, please come volunteer. Unfortunately, we've had to do a little bit of changing of plans. We have a team that we put together, and we, our goal is to have BBS at the end of July, in person, live. It'll be a little bit different than what we're used to. We, we still want to keep in mind social distancing, the guidelines that are being put out. So we are planning for a fantastic VBS at the end of July. So I'll be looking for volunteers very soon, but. <laughs> That's right. So be patient and again, things change and we're gonna keep planning and working the best we can and making decisions to lead our church in the best way that we can. One thing that I'm really thankful for is the way we've been able to, to feed children in Alberta. We've been doing that in Perdido Key. I'm thankful for our partnership with Gulf Coast Feeding and Miss Karen has been our coordinator for that for the last several weeks. Let's just talk this week, Karen, uh, what kind of ministry is going on through the Point Church in feeding this week? So we have been feeding kids on Tuesdays and Thursdays at actually four different locations throughout the community. We're doing it here at the church and then we're going to some different apartment complexes and giving out food and we've been able in this week to give over 200 meals out to kids this week, which is awesome. But we need some help, we need some partnerships, so we need people to come and to help us give out food. So if you would like to help us do that, just email us at hello at to the point, or you can give the church office a call and we can get you plugged into this awesome ministry. But this week, we are also partnering on Saturday with West Pensacola Baptist and Feeding the Gulf Coast we are going to be giving out 5,000 pounds of food to families, but we need help. That food is all going to arrive at West Pensacola at about 7.30 in the morning, and it all has to be sorted, put together, packaged up for the family. So we need quite a few volunteers to come out and help us with that. That's a big task. So if you want to come out and serve us on Saturday morning from 7 to 11, please email us or call us and let us know that you want to come help be a part of this fantastic ministry. We should be able to feed about 100 families with this ministry. So we're really excited about doing this. Thank you, Karen, for your leadership. And I want to say how glad I am when we're able to partner with other churches to do kingdom work. And so thank you to everyone that's volunteering for all of these ministries, both in our Alberta campus and in Perdido Key. Well, guys, it's just about time for our worship service, and we hope and pray that you'll be challenged and encouraged, and the gospel is going to make a difference in your life today. Feel the darkness shaking 
All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Yes, aren't you thankful for the day that the Holy Spirit quickened you and brought you into new life, the day that God gloriously saved your soul? I'm so happy this morning to sing about my salvation in the Lord. Welcome to church, everybody. Hope you're having a great day so far. Uh, it's our pleasure to get to uh, to worship with you wherever you may be this morning. So uh, we always like to start our services off with scripture reading. So today we're going to be in Mark chapter 8. So if you turn your attention to the screen, we're going to do our reading today from Mark chapter 8. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's continue worshiping me this morning as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all Creatures here below, praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Proclaim the power and 
Well, this morning we find ourselves in an interesting position because typically a couple weeks ago we would have honored our kindergarten, high school, and college graduates in our service. And we wanted to make sure that even in our online presence today that we're able to let you know uh, who it is in our church that's graduating so that we can celebrate with them so that we can rejoice in their accomplishments. So we're going to start with our kindergarten graduates, and we have a bunch of them, and we are excited to let you guys meet them. To They're going to tell you their future plans, who they are, and this week we gave them a gift um, so they can enjoy the summer that now they've got that started. So let's watch our kindergarten graduates. Hi, my name is Donovan. I graduated in kindergarten and... I, from Helen Caro. From Helen Caro, and I want to be a robot builder. Hello, my name is um, Anna Claire Hassemeyer. I'm graduating from kindergarten into um, first grade from Marcus Point Christian School. Um, and what I want to be when I grow up is an astronaut. elementary school and whenever I grow up I want to be a swim class teacher. Hi my name is Trey Kirkman. I'm graduating from Pensacola Christian County and I want to be a fireman when I grow up. Hi my name is Allison Kickler and I'm graduating kindergarten at Alberta Elementary School and I want to be a vet when I grow up. Hey I'm Gabe Tyler. I am graduating from kindergarten from Alberta Elementary School. When I grow up, I want to be a Westerner. Owner. My name is Isabella. I'm graduating from kindergarten from Helen Carroll. And this is what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a gymnast girl. My name's Olivia. I go to Blue Angels. I want to own the Chick-fil-A. My name is Slim Morrison, and I'm from kindergarten. I'm in Alberta School, and I want to be a veteran when I grow up. So congratulations, all of our kindergarten graduates. And mom and dad, congratulations to you too, because you guys have done the work and you've helped your graduates finish out this school year and you've done an amazing job. That's right and especially for our high school graduates I know that for parents this is a huge milestone for you too. Uh, I know my parents were rejoicing whenever I got to that milestone and we just want to say congratulations to all of the parents as well. Um, so we're going to hear from our high school graduates and then I want to tell you a little bit more about them. I'm Charlie Baldwin. I've graduated from Christian Institutes of Arts and Science and I plan on attending college in the fall. Hi there, my name is Hannah Dewhurst. I graduated from Foley High School and in the fall I'm going to be going up to UAB in order to study English. My name is Matthew Jensen. I was homeschooled up until 11th grade and then I joined the Penn School State College for two years. In the fall I'll be going to Texas A&M University on a Navy RTC scholarship and will study computer science. Um, once I graduate I will commission as an officer into the Navy. So congratulations to all of our 2020 graduates. I'm so proud of each and every one of them for the hard work that they've put in. I can't even begin to tell you how many conversations I've had about scholarships, uh, opportunities that they've had, about ways that they're setting themselves up to succeed in the future, not only uh, in professions, but also in pursuing the Lord. That's been a really encouraging thing for me as a student pastor to see over these last few weeks. So this morning when our high school seniors woke up, they were able to come outside uh, and they were able to find a personalized Bible just for them. We want to encourage them to stay in the scriptures as well as a devotion book called New Morning Mercies. Uh, that's been really foundational in my life and we wanted to make sure that we were able to pass that on to them so that they would have all of the resources that they need to succeed spiritually in this next year. And of course, we'll be helping them uh, get plugged into local churches and campus ministries to the various places that they're going. And I want to ask you as our church family to be praying for them, to be lifting them up, 
uh, as they transition into a whole new life stage. Some of them are going to new cities uh, where they don't know that many people, but we know that uh, throughout our Christian community, they can find a place where they're right at home. So let's pray for them together, and then we'll continue with our worship service. Lord, we thank you so much that we're able to rejoice uh, with these guys and girls who are graduating, Lord, whether it's kindergarten, high school, college. And God, we just thank you so much that we're able to be a part of, of their lives, Lord. God, I just think back to just seeing our high school graduates, how much they've grown over the last couple of years, both spiritually and, and mentally. And God, I just thank you that we're able to be a, a small part of, of their journey of following you and serving you. God, I pray that they would land in churches that would continue to nurture them and, and that they would flourish for the kingdom of God. So Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged in this day, that they wouldn't be discouraged about anything that they've missed out on in this season, but that they would know that they're in a unique position to, to share this with their graduating class. So God, I pray that they'd be encouraged in this day, Lord, that we would continue to encourage them in these coming days. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.
It's obvious that many of you have learned it's more blessed to give than to receive. Thank you so much for your faithful giving to the kingdom work of the Point Church. As I was reflecting this week on the last couple of months, it's just amazing to me to see how God has met the need every step of the way. So let me say thank you, thank you, thank you for being so faithful. Some of you are using the 73256 number in your text messaging and then to the point. If you hit send there, it sends you a link back to where you can give. Again, thank you for your faithfulness. And we, last Sunday during the giving portion of the online service, uh, we introduced to you uh, the renovation plan and process and the debt reduction plan uh, for our church over the next three years. We're doing that in phases. Phase one is going to uh, begin immediately. Uh, phase two will uh, progress as money comes in going toward those projects. Uh, we are doing renovations actually on both campuses. Uh, we have some cash that was a part of the acquisition with Alberta that uh, the agreement was is that we would sink that money into that facility uh, to get it up to where we want it to be for ministry. And then in Purdue Key, mainly in our sanctuary, uh, we've been in this building for about 12 years, uh, just freshing it up, giving it a new paint, some new chairs in the auditorium, and then our current chairs are going to Alberta, a uh, scaling down of our stage. And there's this picture on the screen right now. You're kind of seeing it as I'm talking of what it's going to look like. We're going to put a larger projection system up that projects on the wall. It's 27 feet wide and 8 feet tall. So when we're singing and the Bible verses are up there, you'll be able to see it really clear and bright. And we're starting that process after the affirmation of the vote. Okay, So please help us by going uh, online to your email to Realm and casting your vote, affirming the decision of the leadership ministry team. In just a few days as part of this, we are also looking at redoing the outside of all three buildings, uh, painting them and making them match. It's going to look really classy and sharp, I believe, uh, in this community. Just a fresh look for our church. You know, we're able to do that because we all give together, that we all have a heart for our church and for the ministry that's going on here. So as you give today, be mindful that it's going uh, to feeding children, to feeding people around the world, to helping missionaries, and to helping your church be all that God wants it to be in this community. Can we pray for our offering? God, thank you for the opportunity once again to give. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. With joy today, we're reminded of all the blessings that we have in our life that you've given us. So take the gifts of your people this week and use them for your glory. We pray for our special offering on June the 7th as we look at uh, the renovations and we look at our debt reduction for our church. Lord, I'm excited to see what you're going to do uh, as our people rally together and give with joy and thanksgiving. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us during this service through song and sermon. If there's someone listening today that doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior, may today be their day of conversion. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. Right now, right now I'm losing bad. I've stood on a stage time after time, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, Oh, right now I just can't It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down But what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? I know you're able and I know you can say fire with your mighty hand, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. 
They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. A good thing, a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to make mountains unmovable, Lord, give me the strength to be able to sing. It is well with my soul. I know you're able and I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt. Say the word, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. You've been faithful, you've been good all of my days. Jesus, I will cling to you, come what may, because I know. I know you can. I know you're able. I know you can. Say through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt. But all go away if you just say. Today we continue on in our series, Psalm for the Seasons, by looking at the 51st Psalm. At some point, have you ever said, that person is a good singer, or that person is a good communicator? You might say, that person is a good teacher, or that person is a good leader. Have you ever said, that person is a good repenter? Now, it seems a little bit awkward, doesn't it, to say that? Because we don't ever know if a human response is actually coinciding with sincerity of the heart. It's been said many times through the years that the writer of the 51st Psalm is a good repenter. His name is King David. I want to read for you the 51st Psalm that is known as a psalm of repentance. Hear the word of the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. G. Campbell Morgan said about the 51st Psalm, this great song, pulsating with the agony of a sin-stricken soul, helps us to understand the stupendous wonder of the everlasting mercy of our God. Do you find yourselves at times feeling like a sin-stricken soul? Like you need to call out to God, cry out to God for forgiveness. Because friends, we all need forgiveness. Psalm 51 is what is called a penitential psalm. It's a psalm of repentance. There are several of them uh, in this book. And most believe that David wrote this psalm at a time when the most magnified sin-filled story of the whole Bible. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse number 5, describes David by this. David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. What an amazing verse. Maybe you're listening right now and you can relate to this. You've got an except in your life. What's the matter? The matter is, is that one day David looked over on the rooftop to the home next to his palace. There he saw a very beautiful woman bathing on the rooftop. She was married, had a husband, but yet he summoned her to come to the palace and he committed adultery with her, which led to her being pregnant cover this up, Uriah, one of his faithful soldiers in his army, he sends him to the front line of the battle, hoping that he would be killed in order to cover up the situation and make it look like that the child that was born would actually be Uriah's. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Uriah was killed. David brought Bathsheba into the palace to be his wife, and he went back to his kingly duties and responsibilities. You see, David thought that he had succeeded in a great cover-up, covering up his sin. And while on one hand, he, he had his wife, he was in the palace, he thought he succeeded. What we find in reading Psalm 51 is that actually David was a very miserable man. He was miserable because of his sin and what he had done. So it's during this time that most scholars and writers believe that David wrote the 51st Psalm because he was reflecting and thinking back on his life and what he had done, and he wanted to be thoroughly right with God. Friends, part of being thoroughly right with God, I believe, is keeping short accounts with him, short accounts of our sin, because it is sin that separates us from a holy and righteous God. Please hear me today. The greatest issue we have right now in this moment is not COVID-19. The greatest issue in the world is sin. In verses 1 through 5, David gives us a great picture of how to approach God with our sin. 
Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. What actually prompts me to go to God with my sin? When you approach Him, when you pray and you seek Him, what is actually prompting you to do that? I believe there are two ways that we approach Him. The first is we're confronted by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, in John chapter 16, verse number 8, it says, And when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Let me just say, we all ought to be thankful for conviction. We ought to be thankful for the work of the Holy Spirit. You can see it in the text that David is thankful for that. In that, he says to God in verse number 11, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit came upon David. The Bible says when he was anointed as king. David knew that he needed divine help to overcome. He knew that he needed the strength and the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in his life because he was going to continue to struggle with sin. And David was a man after God's own heart. He wanted to live a life pleasing to God. David doesn't want to be out of fellowship. He doesn't want to be out of God's presence. So he says, God, I can't live a holy life without your help, without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what brings us to God in confession and repentance? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But I mean, there's something else that God uses, and we see it in the story of David. Sometimes it takes a brother or a sister or someone to confront us in our sin to wake us up and realize that we need to repent. It might be in a conversation. It might be in a sermon just like this. It might be a, through a teaching moment. Here's the story of David. You can read it in the Old Testament. There's a man, a prophet by the name of Nathan who comes into David's presence. He begins to tell David the story about a man who had a, a, a lot of possessions. He had a lot of cattle and a lot of herds, if you will. But there was one family that had a beautiful little lamb that was the family pet. They loved that lamb. That lamb, no doubt, was with them all the time. It was a prized possession. Nathan says, David, the rich man went in and he took that little lamb from that family. And in that moment, in David's pride and in his anger, he declares in outrage that that man who did that to that little family, he is going to be punished severely for his behavior. Nathan, the prophet of God, points his finger at David, and he says, David, you are the man. The picture there was of David who took Uriah's life, who took Bathsheba to be his wife. What a powerful moment for David. He's already miserable, right? He says here in the text that his sin is always in front of him. He's miserable over what he had done. But now he has been publicly exposed for his sin. You know what I love about Psalm 51? It would be very easy for someone to say, well, you know, he just got caught in the moment. Or sometimes we say, well, they were only sorry because they got caught or they got it fr confronted. Now, again, back to what I said a few minutes ago, one of the reasons we don't say they're a good repenter is because we don't always know that a human response is attached to the sincerity of the heart. But you know what? That's not what Psalm 51 shows us. David is broken over his sin. He doesn't call it a mistake. He doesn't call it a mishap. He doesn't blame it on Bathsheba for luring him into this relationship. He calls it what it needs to be called. He called it sin in his life. You know what David's doing in Psalm 51? He's grieving over his sin. Let me ask you something. Isn't it easier to grieve over the consequences of sin? 
or to grieve over the chaos that we create because of our sin, the mess that we have made, than it is to truly grieve over our sin, to know that we have offended a holy and a righteous God. And David does not say, God, the, the consequences are in front of me. He says, my sin isn't, is before me. In your Christian walk, isn't it better when you just acknowledge your sin, when you deal with your sin, when you are proactive in your sin, when you confess it to God and it doesn't take someone else to point it out for you? David says, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, God, I'm asking you to erase my sin, to wash me thoroughly, to cleanse me from my iniquity because I know that I have transgressed against you. My sin is in my mind. I'm replaying it over and over and over again. God, it's weighting me down. Some people say the question is asked in verse number four, but yeah, what about the sin against Uriah, the sin against Bathsheba, the sin against David's family? The point in that verse is not that that all didn't happen. The point is, is that when we sin, the most important thing in that moment is to know that we have offended a holy and a righteous God. David cries out, God, I was born a sinner, and now I'm defaulting into my flesh. I'm defaulting into my original sin. David comes before God, and he is honest, and he is transparent. Please hear me. I, I, I really believe that we need to hear that today. That's the way we should approach God. Not with a flippant attitude, not with a casual attitude, not with a blaming attitude, not with a not with words like, well, God, you know what I've gone through and that's why I did that. But to come before God in humility and to approach him and to call our behavior exactly what it is. In verse number six, David shifts and he begins to focus on being restored in his relationship with God. David longs to get back where he was. You may be feeling that way today. There might have been a time when you felt closer to God or, or more on fire for Jesus, and you want to get back close. God, I'm not where I used to be, but I know where I want to be. Verse 6 says, in this repentance process, that we must seek truth and wisdom because that's exactly what God wants. God wants truth in us. He wants us to be honest and transparent. He wants, David cries out for God to teach him the wisdom of making the right decisions in the private place, in the secret place. David calls it exactly what it is. God, I've transgressed. That word means I have crossed over the boundaries. Please hear me today, friend. God has always clearly established boundaries for us. Transgression is when we go outside the boundaries. God, I've got iniquity in my life. That word means a perversion, perversion, depravity. We're constantly going to battle our flesh our whole life. And because of that, he says, I have sinned. That word sin means I've missed the mark. Sin pulls us away from that fellowship with God. And David says, I want to be restored. God, teach me. God, guide me. I want to be truthful. I don't want to be deceitful. I don't want to be underhanded. I don't want to cover my sin anymore. I want to be transparent. God, I want to be right with you. I want you to purge me with hyssop. Hyssop there is a branch that would grow in cracks and crevices. You'll find it in your Bible at the time of the Exodus when the people were told to splatter the blood over the doorpost and the angel would pass over them, right? They were told to put that blood over the doorpost with a hyssop branch. When the blood was applied to the altar in the temple, 
It was applied with a hyssop branch by the high priest for the covering of sin. David is saying, I want my heart to be right. I want to be clean. God, wash over me. Then he goes on to say, I want my joy back. Verse number eight, God, I want to be glad again. You know, you know how it is, don't you? I, I do. When you're struggling with sin, when you're wrestling with that, you kind of lose your joy, you lose your song. You're not as glad, you're not as happy. And David admits here in the text that it's affecting him physically, mentally. It's affecting him in verse 3 in his eyes, verse 6 in his mind, in verse number 8, his ears, and literally the bones of his body. He's shaken all the way to his inner man. Verse 10, his heart needs to be created again. He needs to get his spirit right. It's affecting his hands in verse number 14. He confesses that his lips have been different. He's been talking a different way. And he says, God, I, I want my lips back. I want to be able to praise and sing and glorify you. I want the joy of thy salvation. Sometimes we misquote that verse. David knows that his salvation is from God. And of course, as we looked at in Psalm 27 a couple of weeks ago, where David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation we look at that a little bit differently today after the cross, but nonetheless, David knew that he needed deliverance. God, I need the joy of your deliverance. Please hear me, friend. Sometimes we need deliverance from our enemies. Sometimes we need deliverance from our problems. But sometimes we need to be delivered from ourselves. And David was distant. God, save me. God, deliver me. Bring back that joy, God, that only you can bring when I'm in a right relationship with you. And the kind of joy that David talks about in verse number 8 and verse number 12 is a joy that only comes from being right with God, knowing that you have nothing that you're hiding, nothing that you're trying to cover up. Remember this, friends. Before there can ever be true joy, the joy of the Lord, there must first be repentance. There must be confession. The word repentance means to change your mind, that you think differently about whatever you're doing. You don't think, well, you know, I'm justified in doing this. This is the reason why I do this. Or when we confess our sin, that word means to say the same thing that God says about our action and behavior. We just come before God and we get open and we get honest. Say, God, I know and you know. Many times others know. God, clean me. Wash me. Give me the joy back. Renew my spirit. Refresh me. I want to be closer to you. What happens when we live a renewed and refreshed, repented life? In verse number 13, he pivots. This is how we live in a restored life. I love verse 13. David said, God, I want to get back where I was because I've got a mission. I really believe in verse number 13, we see evangelism. We see reaching out to the lost and the broken and those that are bound up by sin because David says, God, I want my influence back. God, if you'll refresh me and new, renew me, what I want to do is I want to spend my days I want to teach transgressors your ways. God, I want to go out and I want to find people who are living outside your boundaries. And I want to teach them what a joy, what security and what blessing it is to live inside the boundaries of God. God, I want to go out and find the people who have done some of the, some of the silly, foolish, knuckleheaded things that I've done. And I want to say to them, you're a sinner. You need to repent, and you need to return to God. That's exactly what verse 13 says. Verse 14, David can feel the heartache over the innocent blood that he has shed. God, if you'll deliver me from this guilt of what I've done, 
very likely a reference to having Uriah killed. God, if you deliver me from this guiltiness that I have, God, this is what I want to do. I want to be in real worship the rest of my life. And I want to spend my days offering up to you a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. I want to do that as a humble, broken man, knowing that my humility and my repentance is pleasing to you. God, you're going to open my mouth for praise. Then he talks about in verse 16 and 17 about the sacrifices of God. What pleases God? What kind of sacrifice is pleasing to him? Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I love what Charles Spurgeon said here. He said, "A, a crushed heart is a fragrant heart. A crushed heart, a broken heart, a broken spirit is a fragrant heart, meaning that it is a sweet savor to our God who loved us so much that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross and to shed his blood so that we could have forgiveness of sin. So now that we live after the cross, we look back and we say, God, Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for giving us your best and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, God, I want to give you my very best. I don't want to stay tangled up in the things of this world. I I don't want to stay tangled up in my sin. I don't want to hide it or cover it. I want to confess it. I want to praise you. I want to thank you for your forgiveness that is granted at the cross. Oh, the beauty of the cross. The beauty of the cross. Could we come to the foot of the cross today for just a moment before we take communion? And could we gaze upon it? And could we see the price that Jesus paid for us? He took our sin, our punishment, the wrath of God upon himself. He died and he suffered. Not that we would be casual or flippant about our sin, but that we would be thankful and broken over our sin because it's our sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. Oh, the day when I was 13 years old, when I called on the name of the Lord, I repented of my sins and I asked Christ into my life. My life has never been the same. Have I messed up? Have I sinned? Absolutely. But the beauty of the gospel is that I need it every day to deliver me from myself and to deliver me from my decisions. And you know what? That has a big part in verses 18 to 19, and I'm done. David pivots right at the end, and it's and it's like he is saying, I, I God, please, I don't want my actions to hurt others. David had a love in his heart for Zion, his hometown, his home city, God's holy city. God, would you please bless Zion? Would you protect us? God, in this place, as you bless us and protect us, we want our families to be right. We want to offer the right kind of sacrifice. God, we don't want to go through the motions. We want to have true hearts that are turned toward you. And you know, friends, The same should be true for us today. We should have a love and desire for our hometown. Let's let's start with our home. We should have a love for our family, our church, our friends, our community. You know, the Bible says that sin brings a reproach upon a nation. That's what it says in the book of Psalms. And right now, if you're truly growing in Christ and you're maturing, You're not saying, well, you know, I just really don't want to hear how bad I am. What you're saying is, man, I need to hear that more often. Because we all need to repent and be restored and renewed so that we can go out and live the gospel and truly make a difference. You know, 
Psalm 51 fits in today so beautifully with us choosing this as a day to do communion. So we're doing communion at our outdoor services, but we want to take a moment and give you the opportunity to do communion. What is communion about for the Christian? It's about coming back to the cross. It's about being confronted with our sin. It's a time to examine ourselves and to see if things are right with the Lord. It's a time for us to read Psalm 51 and say, Oh God, would you expose anything in my heart? You suffered in your body on the cross, pain and agony. You shed your blood for a reason. And that reason is because the awful, awful thing called sin. If you're not a Christian, we pray that right now you'd pause and reflect and let God speak to you about being born again. Every person must acknowledge that they're a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess their sin. If you're a Christian today right now, it would be most appropriate for you to pause and for you to say, like the hymn writer said, God, see if there be any wicked way in me. Could we pray together? God, we thank you for this psalm today. How it's ministered to my heart and my soul as I've studied it. Lord, I, I can relate to David and feeling broken over offending you. But I also can feel the joy in David's life as he's restored into fellowship with you. And so, God, we want to be right with you. We want our hearts to be clean and pure before you. You told us as your people to often come to the table together and to take the communion, the bread and the juice, to be reminded of what you did for us on the cross because of our problem of sin. So now we confess to you corporately our apathy, the idols that we've let creep into our lives, our lack of zeal and fervor for the lost, our selfishness and our pride, so many things that creep into our lives. Oh God, we repent. And as we take this communion now, we thank you for the body and for the blood that was given for us on the cross. Would you take the wafer now in your hand? As we take this, it is a symbol we do not believe in the presence of Christ in the wafer. We do not believe that it turns into the body of Christ. Just as the Passover meal was symbolic, this is a symbol of Jesus' physical human body that suffered and hung on the cross 2,000 years ago for us. Jesus, thank you for your body that was given on the cross. Let's take together. Next, we'll take the juice in our hand. Oh, the precious blood, precious blood of Jesus. It's just as powerful and forgiving, restorative as it's ever been when we become good repenters and we change our mind about our behavior and we confess to God how we have sinned. The blood cleanses us from all our sins. Without it, there would be no forgiveness. Jesus, we thank you today for your blood that was shed on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And we receive this juice today with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts for the power of the blood. Let's take together. I hope that you've been encouraged today by the service. I hope you've been challenged. If we can counsel with you, help you, encourage you in any way, please reach out to us. 
Hello at to the point dot church. You can call the church office 850-492-1545. We'd love to counsel you, help you, pray with you, serve you in any way that we can. And we finish up the service today with a blessing. We want to sing this blessing as we prepare to be sent out today. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward